Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. Uh, a few quick tidbits about MUCOM, uh, Marion University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, if you were on a call before, you've heard my whole big spiel about the school, but just some, just a brief overview here. Uh, we're a new osteopathic medical school. We are actually the first osteopathic medical school in Indiana and the first Catholic osteopathic medical school in the country. Uh, we opened our doors just last year, August 2013. We are a traditional four-year DO program. Our curriculum is a competency-based integrated curriculum and we are iPad exclusive. Uh, the IT supported iPads come equipped with library resources, textbooks, uh, our Canvas learning management system, and of course Softest M, which is the exam soft component needed for students to take examinations on the iPad in a secure environment. As the abstract outlines here, and you may have seen that earlier, uh, I plan to share with you today the techniques we employ here at MUCOM to monitor student progress using performance and other data, as well as the resulting reports we furnish to stakeholders in an effort to track the whole student. We're going to try polling today to add an interactive component, um, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, I like to uh, make it more interactive, but also learn more about uh, the group and, and your stance on some of the topics that we'll be touching on today. Uh, there will be a Q&A, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, at the end. Uh, I welcome you to contact me offline after the session if you have other questions, you need a sounding board, or if you'd like to brainstorm on topics relating to student success and building a culture of evidence at your institution. I love collaborating uh, on all those fronts. So I always like to start out um, by uh, placing my stakeholders at the forefront of my mind uh, when thinking about embedded assessment, who we're collecting student performance data for and to what end. And, and I'm sure this list looks very similar to uh, your list. Um, with that in mind and in terms of who needs to be looking at the whole student, we consider of course the students themselves, uh, our faculty, uh, student Progress Committee, Admissions Office, uh, Administration, and our accreditors. So what I hope will become clear in this presentation is that by tracking the whole student in the way I'll describe, aids with stakeholders inclu stakeholder inclusiveness, and this lends itself well to building a culture of assessment at our institutions. Okay, so um, Stephanie, I'm ready to uh, do my first polling question, uh, and I just thought it would be interesting to ascertain um, everyone's role here in terms of developing an assessment culture. Um, I probably could have worded these choices a little differently, but I was trying to kind of delineate uh, who who um, currently who has this as a role in their current position, um, who has just been asked to uh, assume this role, or who has kind of just organically they volunteered or it has become kind of their mission or their passion to uh, to uh, develop any kind of an assessment culture at your institution. Okay, the poll is up. We're going to give it just a couple more seconds if anybody would like to jump in. Right now we're sitting at about 50-50. 55% uh, at this is a role of my current position and 45% at I have volunteered for this role. It's fluctuating a little bit. Now we're at 6238. Um, I'm going to give it five more seconds so we're right at a minute. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and close that up. Uh, the uh, end result was 56% said this is a role of my current position, 13% at I have been asked to assume this role, and 31% at I have volunteered for this role. Okay, great. And if we could just answer one other question and then I'll uh, make comments on those. The, the second poll, and I don't know if you're seeing my screen or Stephanie's, um, I'm just wondering, and this is anonymous of course and will be aggregated, um, how would you rate the culture of assessment or evidence at your institution currently? And I will certainly share with you what I feel mine is. <laughs> we seem to be getting a little bit more interaction with this second one, so I'm going to give it a about 10 more seconds for everybody to chime in and then I'll read the results. Sure. It's a more common Likert scale, most likely that's why. Okay. 
Okay, so with the second uh, poll, the results were 6% uh, rated it excellent, 12% rated it very good, 53% rated it satisfactory, 29% rated it very poor, and 0% at unacceptable. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. And so that's good news. Nobody is in an unacceptable mode. Um, I have to say that uh, I think our school is in, I'd say, satisfactory mode right now. Um, we are a new school. I think that um, there's a definite difference between uh, having to culture shift uh, in an existing school versus uh, starting this culture from the ground up, although, again, neither is without uh, its challenges. Um, I think I think we can agree that assessment is everyone's responsibility. It's it's not just the assessment office, but I would offer that so is building this culture. And and of course, not all of our stakeholders know that. So then I guess that's kind of the trick. So let me just move on to my next slide here. So that's, uh, those of us with assessment responsibilities, we collect the data, we recognize our champions, um, we ask you know them to showcase their work to their colleagues and with a little creativity we wait and we watch that culture grow um, I do emphasize the word wait because in my experience um, this is not just something that goes viral as they say um, culture, build, culture building is oftentimes a slow and gradual process and it takes time um, but I do encourage you to let the data do the talking and that's kind of going to be the, the gist of my presentation going forward um, if you've heard me speak before, I'm constantly using the mantra, it's a journey, not a destination, and that is just so true in terms of uh, building a culture of assessment, um, as well as um, trusting the process, because again, it is, it is gradual, and sometimes we're not sure uh, we're seeing the fruit. So, okay, moving on. Our approach to tracking student progress holistically at uh, MUCOM is three-pronged and in this webinar I'd like to describe each of these components to you and talk about the usefulness of embedded assessment and the resulting data that supports each. We supply stakeholders with student data from three key sources as you can see here. The first is our admissions database or AMP system. The second is exam score data over the course of a student's first two years in the DO program. And third is, um, and we, we're not here yet, but we do plan to supply clerkship uh, rotation performance data as well. So the first component I want to share is the admissions piece, and, and here's what we're doing. So we consulted with faculty advisors uh, right when, when we started here to ascertain what information from our AMP system would be most helpful in familiarizing themselves uh, with, with their new advisees. And if, if you've got any kind of admissions database, which I'm sure you do, um, you know the uh, information that's captured during the application process. I mean, there's just tons of it, and so we really wanted to kind of narrow that down. Um, it was determined that the items shown here uh, would be most helpful and so have been exported and distributed accordingly. Uh, information is disseminated exclusively to an advisor as it relates to their advisees only at the beginning of fall semester first year. So now advisors have their baseline on their students before they meet them. Most of what's listed here is self-explanatory, but briefly, MMIs um, were developed in 2001 at McMaster University School of Medicine. It's an aggregated score that students receive during the application process when multiple mini-interviews, hence the acronym, are conducted in a timed format to assess their soft skills. So um, additionally, this allows us a balanced look um, at our candidates' uh, cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So I think it's uh, nice to have shared that information with advisors as well because now they're, they're getting that kind of balanced look. Component two, and a large piece uh, to our process, is the exam data. And this is where the embedded assessment comes in. So what you're seeing here is an example of data that we've collected and I've, we call it coded or categorized, so I'm not sure what terms you're familiar with, but uh, you can code and categorize in ExamSoft. Um, and we do this during written and practical exams in year one and two. Right now, score data is exported from ExamSoft into a report by advisor again and distributed accordingly after every single exam. 
Again, advisors are only receiving information on how their advisees are faring. So this graphic is an example of what the report looks like where each row would be an individual student. An actual report would contain the student's name in the leftmost column. So obviously for anonymity I had to pull that out. Um, but the, this full report, not just uh, again, this is advisor, advisee specific, but the actual full-blown report of the cohort uh, is sent to our student progress committee and to admissions. Um, this data allows advisors, students, and the progress committee to be abreast of first test failures for early detection of struggling learners. And additionally, excuse me, additionally, uh, student affairs is uh, made aware of this information and they also have their finger on the pulse of first test failures and immediately engage the student and um, provide them with, uh, make them aware of the services and, and get them the assistance that they need. Okay, so exam scores are also provided to students via our learning management system. As I indicated, we use Canvas here. Um, and ExamSoft strength and improvement opportunity opportunities reports featured here on the left. Another report we supply to students is what we call a question by question detail report. And if you look closely, you'll notice we do not provide exam questions to students in any of our reports. So the question by question report gives them details associated with how each question was coded to a learning domain, competency domain, system, discipline, and typically to the lecture objective level to support students with self-remediation. Both the strengths and improvement opportunities and the question by question reports are a great example of the power of coding in terms of looking at the whole student as well as helping them to see how they're progressing with each exam. Now this strength and improvements opportunity report uh, on the left here was one I borrowed from ExamSoft. So this example also shows how students can learn from one particular exam on how they fared. Um, it shows six of Bloom's learning domains. We actually, if, if this were a real report from our school, um, we actually collapsed it and so we use knowledge, application, and synthesis. So we have three cognitive levels that we use. Um, again, it's a great visual aid. It clearly glide, guides the student um, to see where their strengths and weaknesses lie. Now to your right, uh, this is one of our actual question by question reports. So our exam coordinator actually numbers these in order of lecture held so that students can map back. Um, Again, question stems are not provided, but you can see how the student can review how they fared with this report as well. The two reports work quite nicely together, actually, and um, I believe our exam coordinator provides instruction to them on, on how they can use these uh, together. Uh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say about that. So with an automated method for administering exams and collecting this data, without it, we would really not be able to pro provide such a well-rounded look at the students. Okay, so this is our third component. Clinical rotations take place in years three and four of the DO curriculum. There are approximately 14 core rotations, most of which take place in year three, and those are followed by the remainder and elective rotations in a specialty or other area in year four. In terms of data we will share with stakeholders to complete our holistic look at each student's progress, it will consist of preceptor's competency-based evaluation data on each student. We're still thinking about how we might use ExamSoft for the journaling piece that we will ask students to perform during rotations. Um, what I'm thinking about um, is an idea to create an essay exam with an associated rubric for evaluation and that can be very easily done in ExamSoft. I don't have a snapshot of this for you because as I said we're still brainstorming with that. Uh, rubrics will be considered for other assignments as well. Um, we're still finalizing this aspect of our curriculum. Um, I believe we are currently using rubrics for our small group evaluations in our Introduction to Clinical Medicine course. So um, we are definitely uh, playing, playing in the rubric playground. Um, other external data uh, we as an osteopathic medical school will include with the clerkship component in reports to advisors. 
uh, for this holistic look are the COMLEX Level 1 exam scores, which students must have completed successfully to embark on clerkship, as well as COMAT exam score data, which are the College of Osteopathic Medicine aptitude tests that take place at the conclusion of each specialty rotation. To address the rest of our stakeholders that I listed earlier, um, student progress data is of course shared with deans and department chairs regularly and also submitted as evidence in self-studies as needed to the Higher Learning Commission and the Commission on Osteopathic College Accreditation. Uh, we're actually embarking on composing our second COCA self-study as we speak uh, with visitors arriving in January. So we are uh, we are hot on the trail of uh, getting this data organized and, and submitted appropriately. And so how are we doing? Again, as a new, as a new school, I would have to say so far so good. Uh, uh, again, we're, we're a new school and so we're, we're building this culture from the ground up. Uh, we've been continuously improving from day one. We use as much of the feedback um, that we can from all of our stakeholders taking all suggestions into account uh, with regard to how to how to best holistically look and track uh, the student. Uh, we did identify at our, our retreat this past summer uh, that we need to continue to work on our coding structure. Um, and as you can see, and ho hopefully you saw from the reports, that those are really key to the usefulness of the data for everyone involved. Um, also, student report content, which again is also kind of a function of the coding, but um, we're posing the question to faculty and students, um, what, is the most use, what is most useful for the students to see on these post-exam reports, and, and we hope to tight, you know, tighten that up as we go. Um, the most important thing I will say is that um, truly the, uh, the best method for developing this culture has been collecting this data. I call it catch and release. So you're, you're catching the data and then you're releasing it out and um, it has been very compelling uh, to our faculty and staff and has what really after we did that after our first year and then had our retreat is when people really started to kind of grab on and looking at the data and, and started to make improvements to their coding, et cetera. And so um, it's been very exciting to see this culture really um, develop over time. It, it was just so much easier after we got through our first year and we had data to look at and uh, people have really become invested in this process. So I just encourage you that uh, it's, really, it's really the data doing the work. Um, and then I think I'm, I'm summarizing. Uh, by tracking the whole student, we're truly involving more stakeholders in the process which lends itself well to building this culture. We're supplying stakeholders with student data from those three key sources. Uh, the first, again, was admissions database. Second uh, are the, the embedded uh, exam scores over the course of the first two years in the program. And as you can see, we do rely heavily on that data. Uh, and third, we will supply the clerkship and rotation performance data as well. And um, that that is really what I wanted to share with you today. Um, there are so many other areas that I can expound on. Uh, I didn't want to be redundant with my previous um, presentation, uh, but certainly any questions that you have, I'm happy to answer. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimenez. And just for reference, uh, Dr. Jimenez's uh, previous uh, uh, webinar can be found uh, listed on our resources page as well on learn.examsoft.com forward slash resources. If you search for her uh, last name there, you'll find the recording of, of that other uh, really great presentation. We're going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions now. Again, if you do have a question you'd like to pose to Dr. Jimenez, you can type that through the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll go ahead and take a few minutes now to read those out and uh, give her an opportunity to answer them. Looks like we already have a couple. The first question I've got is, what suggestions would you provide to an older program attempting to set up a more robust feedback system like this? Uh, well, I think, first of all, you need to definitely, uh, you need to take it slow. I would suggest, you know, the way, the way in which I approach everything is piloting. And so my biggest suggestion would be um, you've, you've got to ease into this. 
Um, so I would suggest uh, finding the the uh, the the program or um, perhaps a couple of courses in that program whereby you could actually uh, start to implement this slowly. Um, find your champions or the people that are most interested in doing this, um, and 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 utilize those folks, um, the people who are the best campaigners um, at your school, and um, and and develop out an implementation pro you know plan for yourself but I would highly encourage you to, um, to you know and again it depends on I know that's not always realistic some people need to implement you know an expedite quickly um, but I really do think that gradual you know a gradual uh, transition is the best um, so that would be my suggestion and to start pilot piloting this in in courses where uh, course directors are very interested in trying this trying this automated method of embedded assessment. Great, thank you. The next question we have is, what do you expect will surface as the most important data to share with students? Well, for us, uh, it, it's going to be our competencies. And um, I didn't get too heavily into that because, that again, that was at a previous uh, webinar. But um, we are very competency uh, based and so uh, we want our you know our students want to know how they're doing in these competency areas it's very mapped to our Comlex blueprint and so um, that's very uh, very important uh, also we also track uh, by system and discipline and that's also important to the students to be looking at um, in terms of their success their progress as well as their success Wonderful. Uh, next question is, is your program tracking student learning longitudinally, and if so, how? Yes, and actually uh, that was a, a piece that I forgot to share um, with my, uh, when I was showing you the exam data slide. Um, we can actually track uh, longitudinally, and there are reports that can be provided to students and advisors, um, and it it's, instead of a snapshot of the actual exam and how they fared with all of this, these different systems and disciplines, um, a student can actually view a longitudinal report that shows how they're doing in a particular system, discipline, competency domain, uh, cognitive learning domain um, over time. So literally, you, the student or the um, I know administrators can do this too, would actually put in you know, a start and end date, so you, whatever snapshot of time that you want, and that data can be collected. Um, we did this in, uh, at my previous institution, uh, which was a pharmacy school, and um, these reports were so incredibly useful that we were able to create an automated um, advising system whereby these reports were generated for students, I think we did it uh, per semester, we allowed the students to review these reports and then we set up a system um, in our, we had a rotation management software that we used and we set it up such that a student was asked to look at their longitudinal report, identify some of their strengths, also identify some of their focus areas and, and kind of just briefly journal on that and then that information was, um, you know, got flagged to their advisor and it gave the advisor the ability to virtually converse with the student about their concerns or about their, you know, celebratory, you know, celebratory uh, areas that, that they were doing very well on. Uh, so yes, tr longitudinal tracking is taking place. We are currently holding off on that here in this medical school uh, because of um, the uh, improvement that I just mentioned that we identified over the summer, which is that we really, again, it's our first year out. We put our coding together very thoughtfully um, before the school started, but certainly you don't know what you don't know. And so now after the data came out and we started looking at it, we thought, oh, you know, this, this, isn't, this isn't as informing as we thought in certain areas. And so perhaps we need to tighten up that coding before we start uh, providing this information to our students. Next question is, I'm assuming all these reports are aggregated and then distributed automatically. What is the background effort like for this? Okay, well in terms of the uh, reports that are generated via ExamSoft, that's really pretty much a click of a button. Uh, so that's not, there's not a lot of back end. The, these reports, um, they're already created in ExamSoft, so there's just some filtering that takes place to generate those. 
uh, to the students and uh, correct me if I'm wrong Stephanie but when you create them for a particular exam they're generated in mass for the students I don't think they're you know you don't have to do them individually they're, they're just created for that whatever cohort is, is associated with that particular exam um, in terms of the uh, report I showed you that's generated for advisors that again is also an export and so there is a little maybe a, a little bit more time associated with getting that organized but uh, it's in spreadsheet format and I think she, actually I think she's imported that into a database so that queries have been created for each advisor so that she can just pull those reports or our exam coordinator can pull those reports fairly quickly and all she's doing really is each time an exam takes place is adding another column so it's pretty it's fairly minimal in terms of the work associated with generating the reports great thank you the next question is what kind of retreat did you hold to get more people invested the retreat that we had was a faculty retreat and during that retreat I uh, got I got my team on the agenda I, I have a um, my department is educational development so I oversee accreditation assessment and faculty development so what I did was I asked my director of assessment to look at uh, some of the data that we had collected uh, not only the exam score data but the course instructor data and um, we also do focus groups after every course so uh, I asked her to put together a presentation and to showcase that information to our faculty um, and it was at that time uh, that when we shared that information with them uh, they started to see we all oh, there's something else that we do let me just add this in there at the end of each course I ask for a um, an item analysis report to be sent to uh, the course director also so they can see how their uh, test items fared etc so I, I believe that that in conjunction with the retreat and the data that we showcased at that point um, is what kind of uh, it was kind of an epiphany and uh, people realize that wow this is really good information but we need to tighten this up Great. Looks like we've got one more question. Uh, last question is, who were involved in developing uh, the codes in your institution? Everybody was involved, and that's uh, another uh, big recommendation in terms of buy-in. Uh, when we developed this, our coding structure, uh, we definitely had some ideas, or should I say vision, of our dean in terms of this competency-based integrated curriculum. That's something that he wants to do here. It's very innovative. And so we knew right away that we were going to be mapping to our uh, NBOME competencies uh, for the students. Uh, we knew that, for example, we were going to definitely be tracking to some cognitive as well as some psychomotor learning domains uh, and, and certainly systems and disciplines. Um, we, we put that coding structure together and we brought that before the faculty uh, to you know get the buy-in and the feedback and to really kind of massage that coding system. Beyond that, we have uh, given each course director the freedom to code course specifically and that has been amazing and so um, everybody is able to look at their course and their content and build their own coding structure within so that helps us to make sure we have consistent data coming in uh, and that we're tracking it appropriately uh, again from the competency standpoint systems disciplines etc but that we're also coding in a way that each of our you know each of our course directors is an expert in their content area and so who who better to identify the course specific coding for that for that class um, and so we have that as well so every again in terms of stakeholder buy-in it's important to include as many people in that process as possible great thank you so much Dr. Jimenez uh, mm -hmm. it looks like that was the last question so we're going to go ahead and wrap everything up now um, just as a quick reminder to the audience yes this uh, record this webinar has been recorded and we'll be sending out an email in the next 48 hours or so that will have a link to that recording um, please feel free to share that with colleagues or peers as you would like uh, also as soon as you click out of the webinar and exit you should get a survey pop-up for you again we'd just like to encourage everybody to take a few minutes and fill that out if at all possible I'd like to thank Dr. Jimenez for uh, sharing her experiences today 
If you have questions for her, uh, her email address is on the screen at uh, sjimenez at marion.edu. If you have questions for ExamSoft, we can be reached at info at examsoft.com. And uh, we'd like to thank everybody for their time uh, this afternoon. Hope you have a great day. And please join us again at one of our uh, following uh, presentations. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.